You guys have been putting some awesome questions down in the comments for us to tackle. On one of our previous videos all about how ejection seats work, Sergeant Viper asked, if humans are able to develop ways of living in space, is it possible to use similar technology to allow humans to live underwater? Well, let's give that one a go. Whether it's thanks to climate change or asteroid impact or the threat of nuclear war, there's the general feeling that humanity might want to get the heck out of Dodge pretty soon. Many think that space is the natural option for future colonies, but instead of looking up, should we be looking down to the 70% of the planet's surface that are our oceans? Could we live in Bioshock style underwater cities? And could our knowledge of how to survive in space help us out? So first up, should we be diving into the ocean rather than blasting into space? Is submarine designer Graham Hawkes onto something when he tells any space fan he meets, your rockets are pointed in the wrong goddamn direction? Well, you might want to head into space for the adventure or the huge open spaces or the planets and asteroids potentially packed full of resources but you can get all that from the deep ocean too and if it's life you're after well then what we've seen of mars so far we appear to have a much better chance of finding weird life forms in our own oceans here on sol 3 on earth Remember, it was only in the 1970s that we discovered entire ecosystems living up around ocean vents that don't rely on sunlight like life does topside. Oh, and just to clear something up, you might have heard the factoid that says that we've only explored 5% of the ocean. Well, turns out we actually do have fairly accurate maps of the whole of the ocean floor. We just know about it to a resolution of about five kilometers or so. So we do know pretty much every structure down there that's larger than Regent's Park. Another thing in favor of heading down instead of up is that it would be easier to get food and supplies down there. Plus the marine food chain is already up and running compared to a whole lot of nothing in space. So far, so good. Let's all become aquanauts rather than astronauts, right? Hang on, hang on. Before we all pack our bags and jump in a submersible, what are the downsides of a watery existence? Well, for humans without gills, that's all of us, there's no air to breathe. If you're living in a fixed underwater habitat, your air is shipped in. In 2014, Bruce Cantrell and Jessica Fain set the record for living underwater in a fixed location, surviving about seven meters beneath the waves for over 73 days. They breathed compressed air in something called a pressurized, saturated diving environment. You see, water is heavy. And when you're underneath it, there's a lot of stuff pushing down on top of you, adding a whole atmosphere's worth of pressure for roughly every 10 meters that you dive. So say you lived at an ocean depth of 300 meters, well then you've got 31 times the normal atmospheric pressure pushing on every part of you, and that is quite some squeeze. To survive, the pressurized diving environment that you're in needs to match the pressure of the sea outside so that you don't feel that intense difference in pressure. But that means that the air you're breathing also must match the water pressure around you too. And breathing high pressure air means that the gases that it contains, especially nitrogen, dissolves into your blood and body tissues more. The word saturated in pressurized saturated diving environment is saying that there's so much of that gas already dissolved into the body's tissues, you can't fit any more in. An environment like that lets you dive deep into the ocean without risking the bends. Now the bends is a nasty decompression sickness that occurs when those bubbles of gas come out of solution in your blood when the pressure around you drops as you go back up. It's just like bubbles rushing out of a bottle of fizzy wine when you open it, but you know, inside your body. And it's not ideal for you being a human champagne bottle when the cork is popped. Avoiding the bends is great, but the problem is that saturated diving isn't too good for your body. Over time, breathing in greater amounts of oxygen in every breath may damage our circulatory systems. Plus, the compressed air environment seems to make food taste blander, which I think you'll agree is the biggest of all the concerns, and it'll eventually make you act loopy. The more nitrogen that dissolves into your blood, the more you experience nitrogen narcosis, also known as the martini effect, because you feel like you do when you've had one or two of my favorite cocktail. 
Oh, and uh, coming back to land would have to be a very slow process because when you've been living in a pressurised habitat, you need to very slowly depressurise to allow those gases to safely come out of solution in your blood. Finally, in the downsides of living underwater column, you can't avoid the various other health issues caused by being deep in the ocean, including rampant infections caused by damp, humid conditions, or reduced vitamin D from the lack of sunlight, and what's called creeping crud, a nasty skin infection caused by too much peeing in wetsuits. Not that anyone would ever do that, of course. So, how does this stack up against the challenges of living on a space station? Well, in space, you don't need to deal with the pressure coming from the outside of your space station in, but rather losing your air pressure out to the near vacuum outside. And microgravity can be a real issue. Okay, so yeah, you might finally cross over the six foot mark as the squashy discs between your vertebrae expand and you get taller but our muscles expect to work against gravity. And rather than just enjoying the rest, they actually start to shrink without it, even the muscles in your heart. Calcium and phosphate in bones also start to get reabsorbed into the body, leading to easier breaks. Basically, if you hang out in space, you grow a little bit, but you slowly get weaker and weaker. Plus, there's an invisible threat in space, not the Klingons, radiation. On Earth, we're protected by our atmosphere, which blocks 99% of cosmic radiation. And under the ocean, in fact, you've got that additional shield of the water above you. But in space, you are totally exposed. Radiation is coming at you from everywhere, from the sun to galactic cosmic rays. There's so much of it, in fact, that when astronauts close their eyes, they sometimes see bright flashes as cosmic rays pass straight through their eyeballs and hit their optic nerves. Of course, the real problem isn't that cool eye thing. It's the damage that the radiation does to your body and your DNA that can potentially lead to cancer. So, living in space and living underwater, they both have exciting pros and pretty huge cons. If we're making it out there or under there, we need a bit more study. But, as Sergeant Viper asks, could we use the knowledge that we've garnered from missions to space to help us find a way to live underwater? Well, an aquatic existence does share something with a galactic one. In any confined space, microorganisms pass quickly from person to person. So whether you're up in space in a spacecraft or underwater in a giant bubble or whatever you choose, you're going to have these same problems with infections and disease. NASA actually considers such hostile closed environments to be one of the five main challenges facing people on a trip to Mars. They also worry about isolation and confinement, another problem shared with living underwater. And for this reason, NASA actually use underwater environments to simulate space. Buzz Aldrin trained for the moon landings under the sea. And today, astronauts go live in an underwater habitat about 20 meters below the surface to simulate life and work in microgravity. Okay, it might not feel exactly like space, but living in the ocean is a great simulator for long periods in cramped, shared conditions. So you could actually turn all this round and say that living underwater has helped us learn how to live in space. And it's prepared us well, as people have lived way longer in space than the 73 days spent in fixed habitat underwater, or even the six-ish months spent in submarines. The current record is 437 days up there. If you did want to swap Terra for Aqua, then your best bet at the moment would probably be a nuclear submarine. They keep themselves at a surface-like pressure and they make their own air and drinking water from the sea. So you wouldn't experience the same pressure problems that pressurised ocean dwellers do. Or, if you're willing to postpone your underwater adventure for a while, then there are proposals for underwater ocean scraper buildings that get thicker the further down you go, or modular, sinkable living pods to accommodate the population as the planet gets more crowded. So, spacesuit or surf shorts, it's a tough choice, but I know I'm going for neither until they solve that creeping crud problem. Thanks for your question, Sergeant Viper, and if you have a burning science question for us, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.